We started this series in part because I had been reflecting on a decision that I regretted as a math teacher to stop and go back and remediate. And as we talked to so many content experts and practitioners and teachers and researchers, I was struck by how many people had similar stories and also by how much the research has really confirmed that this idea of moving forward and being ready for just-in-time support is far more effective than the preemptive just-in-case remediation. It's a counterintuitive idea because we have so many good intentions that often lead us to think that we need to prepare students with the prerequisite skills. And each content is a bit different. There are different load-bearing walls that are important to touch on, but across the board, it does seem like we will be best off and support kids most equitably if we actually move forward. Here are some of what we heard. I do think that the notion of putting kids onto a pathway where mm -hmm. they have to march through every standard before they're allowed to get up to higher grade level tasks with their peers is a is a both a faulty metaphor mm -hmm. and is one that will contribute to greater inequity. Mm -hmm. I think our um, where we have seen intervention done best to so schools that have both managed to provide significant support for student growth as well as um, frankly have students um, meet and achieve grade level standards, which by the way is very important if we're expecting kids to be able to access college and access higher level learning later, um, are places where there's an acknowledgement that there are likely dual pathways that are happening for kids. What we work really hard at Unbound Ed to do is to show that first of all, having grade level, rigorous, engaging, meaningful, affirming instruction is social justice work mm -hmm. is one of the ways that we ensure that education is an equalizer. Mm -hmm. Now, the other piece to that is having been a practitioner myself, knowing that students will come in, right? With unfinished mm -hmm. teaching, will mm -hmm. come in not with all of the prerequisite skills needed mm -hmm. for that grade level rigorous, affirming, engaging, meaningful work. I, as the practitioner, have to have my knapsack filled with, first of all, the scaffolds, mm -hmm. understanding how those scaffolds are worked, are, are mm -hmm. used, mm -hmm. understanding that scaffolds are literally the meaning of that, which means it's temporary, that eventually mm -hmm. they should fall away. Mm -hmm. Knowing the difference between a scaffold and a modification, mm -hmm. having enough guts to ask myself, Am I, is there a reason why I am not offering up the grade level in this moment? Is there a reason why I'm choosing to modify rather than scaffold? Understanding the role that my perception plays mm -hmm. and what gets executed, amplified, what, how students are defined as learners in ELA and mathematics, so all of that. I've seen a lot of school leaders choose interventions as their tier one curriculum. And I think it's really, really important that we keep in mind that you're not exposing children to grade level text and grade level material and challenging them in that way. Um, just because a child has significant needs doesn't mean that you cannot expose them to grade level text. Yes, it's hard. Yes, you need to provide scaffolding. Yes, you need to help them work through it, but you've got to expose them to it. The art mm -hmm. of teaching is standing before your class and identifying, oops, there's a gap here. How do I circle back and fill that while I'm still mm -hmm. driving on content and knowledge you need to know, right? Like that, mm -hmm. that is the profound art of teaching. Separating out a group of kids who are, um, who have unfinished learning and, and giving them something unrelated to the curriculum mm -hmm. doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, I think reverting to, you know, I think there's going to be a temptation and I completely agree with you here. Everybody is just trying to do the best they can for the kids mm -hmm. and there's pressure on them and there's going to be pressure mm -hmm. from all sorts of directions. Um, and with the best of intentions, I think that pressure might lead people to decide, let's forget about all this conceptual understanding. Let's just teach them all to do the math. 
would just do a sort of, um, you know, hear the procedures, memorize. Hyper procedure, yeah. Hyper procedural curriculum. Um, the danger there is that might work in grade four. You might get kids up to speed for the state test in grade four, but that's been the whole problem with the way we teach mathematics in this country for a long time. Mm -hmm which is that it sort of works for a while, but kids who come out of that sort of curriculum have a very fragile mm -hmm. knowledge of mathematics. So um, in kindergarten, one thing a child kindergartner should be able to do at the end is count in any direction, starting with any number, ideally within 100, but definitely within 20. So if I say, 17 and you start counting down as if i say to the, a child 17 and the direction mm -hmm. is countdown that child should be like 16 15 14 right so counting starting with any number in any direction mm -hmm. this is a load-bearing wall mm -hmm. it's it sounds really unbelievable that it's a load-bearing wall mm. but quite literally children can't subtract in second grade mm. because of that load-bearing wall and the simple thing there is Children spend so much time counting forward, um, and so they can add because they're using count on strategies, but they didn't get enough practice and like just rote practice counting backward. And when we subtract, we are initially counting down as mm -hmm. a strategy. Mm -hmm. And so that's a load bearing wall. So when mm -hmm. we begin third grade and okay, multiplication division isn't going well. Let's go back to second grade. There is nothing there for you. Mm -hmm. There's no load bearing walls before that. It's a brand new concept. Mm -hmm. Teach it mm -hmm. another way. Teach mm -hmm. it another way. Teach mm -hmm. it another way. Fractions, it's not going well. There's nothing behind it. Yeah. Teach it another way. Teach it another way. Teach it another way. You have to meet kids where they are. Let's challenge that right mm -hmm. from the yeah. start. No, no, no. You have to bring kids to the point where they need to be to understand the next thing they need to learn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're, it, it, these are ways of, a, to my mind, of abandoning responsibility. Mm -hmm. But, but I won't say I don't say it that way because people have been trained in this metaphor of development. Mm -hmm. but I think that's the that's the word we should take a look at. Development. A child's mind does not develop the way a child's body does. Mm -hmm. The analogy between the child's development of a body, which is in the control of nature, mm -hmm. is not the case with the child's mind. Yeah, so um, personally and professionally, I really strongly advocate for what we call co-requisite um, education. And essentially what we're trying to do is to make sure that students who have unfinished learning, when they get to the college campus, they actually start as a college student. So no more of the prerequisites that don't have any credit um, that can be added to the student's um, uh, pathway. We're talking about students who have courses that don't have don't bear college credit they're paying for them so they're losing resources that could be used to advance their um, learning toward the degree but also they don't feel like they're a college student and sometimes mm -hmm. that um, we look at that first year as being the real momentum year where they pick mm -hmm. up steam and they really feel confident as learners at the higher educational level when they've got two to three courses in their first semester or even sometimes the second semester if they have to repeat um, a, a remedial mm -hmm. education course they do not feel connected to the college experience and they're more likely to stop out mm -hmm. we actually we, we see a lot of evidence that um, just in time support. So uh, simultaneous support as students are moving forward works a lot better than asking students to start anew with something that didn't work for them the previous year. If the goal is for a student to meet a benchmark, they're mm -hmm. not met, met that, then we can do some type of intervention. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to the framing to be positioned as intervene or have some type of intervention up front without mm -hmm. knowing what kind of resources that students bring to the experience. Programs that are remedial uh, and technically oriented do not, cannot really work in environments that are focused on excellence and moving forward. Mm -hmm. That's not to say you don't have to attend to students' learning needs. Mm -hmm. but when you look at the programs in remediation, community college, it seems like the rhetoric is all focused around some deficiencies, retention, like a kidney ailment, 
the whole language <laughs> when mm -hmm. of remediation on the thin surface looks positive, but it's all focused on students' weakness. Deficit. Mm -hmm. Unless you can practically figure out strengths, you're not going to succeed with this student. Uh, one of the things I want to make sure of, and I think it can be noted here, is COVID can't be the, the new excuse for low expectations. We can't mm -hmm. say, oh, that was, we missed that because of COVID. You mm -hmm. know, uh, remember, we would have been farther along if it hadn't been for COVID. One is that our, we're quick to go to remediation. Mm -hmm. Now just think about that in principle. I begin behind everybody else. And the way you expect me to catch up is to slow me down. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just basic physics. That doesn't work. <laughs> right? If anything, I should be accelerated. Across these conversations, I had three takeaways. One, pushing forward into new learning while being thoughtful about the support students will need is more successful than stopping and going back. Two, understanding what just-in-time supports a student may need requires a deep understanding of how children learn that particular content and what might be load-bearing walls to those new concepts. Three, Focusing on students' strengths and assets and using those to build learning will lead to more progress than focusing on deficits and gaps. The language we use reinforces the way we think about learning. Thanks for listening. Next up, theme five. Even a great plan will not work for all students. Continuously monitoring, understanding, and meeting needs will.